<laughs> okay, it's about 12 o'clock. I want to welcome you to the, um, the, the, the seminar series here at the Connected Ag Experiment Station. Before I begin, I want to let you rem remind you that in 1962, John F. Kennedy said that he had, attained, he had obtained the best of two worlds, a Harvard education and a degree from Yale. And our speaker today comes close. He has an undergraduate degree from Harvard, and then he did his PhD uh, also at Harvard. But then he came to Yale and did a postdoc where he worked on photosynthesis, photosynthesis and transporters in corn. He actually worked at the Lockwood Farm, even as a student at Yale. In, two, in 1994, he came to the station to continue to work on photosynthesis, photosynthesis and transporters in corn and um, Rabidopsis. And in 2015, he finally saw the light and got moved over to plant pathology and ecology, where he's been working on plant pathogen systems. Um, primarily, again, transporters and other metabolites in the uh, plant pathogenic bacterium, Erwinia amylabra. Um, he just returned from a, a sabbatical uh, at Penn State, where he's been there for six months. And you may not know this, but you know, any scientist can apply for sabbatical. Um, if you can, and, and uh, but one of the requirements is that when you return, you do need to report to the station. So the seminar kind of serves for his, his report on his sabbatical work at uh, Penn State with Dr. St um, Tim McNellis. So without any further ado, uh, Neil is going to be talking about probing metabolite requirements for a Winnie Amalabra disease establishment. Thanks, Wade. Um, I hope this works on team. We'll, we'll uh, switch on over to the PowerPoint uh, presentation. Um, and um, so for a long time, I've been in, uh, interested in metabolism and how it affects various processes. Uh, for a long time, I worked with uh, people in the biochemistry and genetics department um, on photosynthesis. Um, and my work stems uh, from what I did as a postdoc at, at Yale, and I'll just touch a little bit upon that. But um, in the last five years or so, I, I, since I came to the plant pathology department, I switched over to looking at Erwinia amylovera, and it is the pathogen that causes fire blight, which is one of the big diseases of apple and pears. Um, and interestingly, you know, since apples and pears are old world, but the bacterium itself is a new world um, species, it just happens to do very well on apples and pears. Um, and it's all, it was first described in about 1784 um, and has been a problem, but it, the problem has gotten worse um, because of agronomic practices, because now they're using dwarf varieties, the plants are closer and they're even doing um, sort of trellis planting where the plants are about 18 inches to two feet apart. So that favors disease spread. It's, it, it's economical to do it that way, but it also exacerbates disease spread. Um, and so we're gonna be looking at what are the nutrients needed for disease establishment. And we have here two classic examples of how the disease presents itself. So here is an immature fruit that is infected with Irwinia amylover, and it causes these ooze um, pustules to form on the outside of the fruit. You also see this shepherd's crook formation on the end of new branches, um, and it looks scorched, hence the name fire blight. And what happened here is the, the um, uh, bacteria has gotten into the vascular system and clogs it up and causes a withering of the plant. So hence the name. Um, my work sort of straddles the area of basic uh, science and applied. In, in basic sciences, we want to know how the organism um, reacts and what it needs nutrient-wise in different parts of the plant and just sort of establish that as a foothold so that maybe new um, control measures can be developed. And on the applied side is this may help aid us uh, to develop new biocontrol agents. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the uh, talk. Here's just a simple cartoon diagram of how the disease uh, works throughout the year. So it overwinters as a canker, usually on uh, right beneath the bark on, on stems or on the um, trunk of the tree. And during the springtime, when things are warming up and the nutrients are coming from the, uh, that have been stored in the roots and they come up into the growing parts of the plants, which would be the leaves and the flowers at that time, you get a reemergence of and a reactivation of the bacteria that causes ooze to form on the outside of cankers, which is very attractive to insects, which can visit that and then move on to 
uh, bring the bacteria to flowers. And also, if you've got a lot of wind, you can get actually strands of the um, bacteria being transported throughout and landing in different parts of the plant. Um, like as any plant disease, it, there's a Goldilocks of environmental conditions that favor whether it's going to be um, disastrous or not. Um, Irwinia amylovera very, very much favors a moist environment and warm conditions so that it can grow once it's infected on the, um, on the flower. And once that happens, it can infect, as we've seen, into the fruit and eventually make its way into the vascular system of the plant. This is the main way that um, the disease is spread through the floral infection. There's a secondary part, which happens a little bit later, and that's called a strikes. And here the bacteria invade into growing leaves and twigs, either by micro abrasions where it can get in or natural openings like hydrosodes. And Kwan's group is now looking at the entry level on how that, and he'll probably be talking about that later on. If it gets into the vascular system, particularly on young plants, it can be very devastating. So plants, you know, between three and five years old that are out there can be really whacked up, particularly if they're grown closer together and you have lots of plants being infected. Um, older plants can survive, but they do get infected into the vasculature that eventually becomes cankers and goes around. gets on the stigma, the bacteria grows because the stigma is a very nutrient rich environment that the pollen lands on and grows down. Um, and Irwinia lands just about the same time that the stigma is very receptive. Once you get the um, amplification of the bacteria, there seems to be something special about the stigma environment where some of the virulence genes are turned and upregulated as if priming itself for infection into the floral system. Um, following um, sort of multiplication on the stigma. If you get a wetting event like dew or a light rain, the bacteria slide down style and into the nectaries in the hydathode and infect the developing, what will be the developing fruit and can amplify in that as we saw in the picture with the ooze and eventually make its way into the stem of the fruit and into the plant, okay. During the disease cycle, um, Irwinia finds itself in lots of different plant locales which have incredibly distinct nutrient landscapes that they have to deal with. So it's, they're not all the same. So the stigma is a different environment than the nectaries. That's a different environment from the developing fruit. That's a different environment from the vascular system. Um, so it has to be nimble metabolically to survive all these conditions. And so we want to use mutants to probe and see what are the requirements of different parts of the plant. A little bit of history um, since I was here more than five years ago. I'm, I think I'm in my 27th year now, which is, I think back is just amazing. Okay. Um, back when I was a postdoc at Yale and, and growing, I was doing corn genetics and we we're growing it up at the Lockwood farm, which is how I was introduced to the experiment station. Um, we were involved in a large mutagenesis project in corn using the transposable element AC, which is the one that um, Barbara McClintock uh, won her Nobel prize on. And we used it as a mutagen to mutate other genes in corn. In our case, we were interested in genes that involve C4 photosynthesis. And this is the, the plant that I worked on. So the light green areas are where the transposon had jumped into the middle of the gene. And as the plant's growing, you can remobilize the transposon out and it restores the activity of the gene because the transposon was in an intron and can restore function. We were interested in genes that would affect the biochemistry and the anatomy of C4 um, trans anatomy. So corn is a C4 plant. And if we all remember back from our plant physiology, uh, most plants are C3 and fix carbon directly into the Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide. But in, in corn, there's a different geometry architecture in the leaf and a different biochemistry that favors um, capturing CO2 and using it fully under warm conditions. And here's basically what happens. This is a cross section of a maize leaf. You have the vascular system surrounded by a bunch of bundle sheath cells. That's where the carbon dioxide is fixed in the, the Calvin cycle. And around that are a bunch of um, mesophyll cells that initially capture the carbon dioxide as malate, which is shunted over to the bundle sheath cells, re-released, and you have huge concentrations of CO2 in the bundle sheath cells that overcome oxygen, photo oxid, uh, oxidation and you get very efficient use of your light captured energy. 
So corn, especially around July 4th and the knee high at July 4th, if you ever see a corn field, once it's about, you know, three feet, it just like they explode, they go really fast. And they're using um, very efficiently the carbon dioxide and the ATP that's gathered, okay? So we found such a mutant in this, what I call leaf permeus, and it turned out it was a transporter for nuclear bases. And here we have a bunch of nuclear bases, xanthine, uric acid, lantone, guanine, adenine, et cetera. And in plants, there are five distinct families of these transporters. Three of them are distinct to plants, the ureide, permeases, purine, permeases, and azaguanine-like transporters. And two of them that are called nuclease cation symporters are found um, in plants, in bacteria, and also in humans. Um, so I did most of my work on nucleus cation symporters, and these are basically in the membrane and they're opened up to the outside. And when a proton and a purine lands in them, they change conformation and dump it on the inside. So it's a sort of a sort of open closed shell type situation. We were doing a lot of studies on the evolutionary function analysis of how these work. And some of our colleagues uh, who are working on the fungal ones were using a site-directed mutagenesis in it our data match up really well with theirs. It was a very fulfilling thing. So that's 20 years of research that I won't go back <laughs> and talk about. Then just like Irwinia finds itself in a change of environment, so did I, and I had to be nimble and adapt. So the biochemistry department um, was folded because we had four scientists and Regan was our, our technician and, and Dick Peterson and Neil McHale were going to retire. And Doug Damien, who was in the department was gonna retire a year later. So that left uh, Regan and I, and we were brought over to the plant pathology department. And at that time, Sharon Douglas was the chair of the department, and she waved a wand over to me and sprinkled what she said was pixie dust, although I think it was fungal spores, and said that I'm now a plant pathologist. And I thought, great, now what do I do? Okay, so fortunately at that time, Lindsay uh, Triplett and Con Zeng were joining the lab and both had done extensive work in your Winnie I'm over. And I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to learn from them and to adapt some of the things that I know. And so they've been very helpful over the years that I've been here. Um, <clears throat> so I started to do some reading and it turns out people had done a bunch of mutagenesis on Irwinia amylovera. And here's one such paper where they made a mutation in a gene called GUA-B that's involved in making guanine and hypoxanthine, some of these purines. And they found that this mutation was not virulent in plants. And this could be because there's little guanine external to the bacteria and you have, it has to make it. And if you can't make it, it's not gonna survive. Or there are no guanine transporters to bring in what's available from the outside or the guanine transporters are turned off. Well, lo and behold, I worked on guanine transporters. So that looked pretty good. Then there was another paper I ran across from a colleague of mine, Tim McNellis, who actually did the um, sabbatical in his lab. And he had looked at it, found a mutant in PYRC, which is in the pruning pathway, the other type of nuclear bases that make uracil and stuff. And when they knocked this one out, it was still virulent, unlike the guanine one. So it was the reverse situation. So it could take in uracil from the outside. Lo and behold, I worked on uracil transporters as well. So this was a, a great segue for me into doing some research. Now, Tim McNellis, um, went on and published a paper in 2019 where they had done a mutagenesis and pulled out a whole bunch of different mutants in biosynthetic pathways and looked and saw if they were um, virulent or not. And some were and some weren't. Two of them that they picked out were the GUA-B and the PYRC that I just talked about. I had known Tim McNellis when I was a postdoc and he was a grad student at Yale working on in Shingong Deng's lab. And so I thought this was a great opportunity to, to go and do a sabbatical because we had common interests in metabolism of the disease organism that he had moved into in the, in the past 20 years or so. And initially this was gonna happen about two and a half years ago, but I had to put it off for family reasons for a year and then COVID hit. So uh, I couldn't go until Ju July this year, but it was very, very helpful. So um, we started doing some studies and he had developed a system that's in use with people in the Irwinia world where you can grade the amount of virulence by looking at fruits, the immature fruits of the apples and infect them with your very strains of Irwinia. And you can see how virulent they are by counting up the amount of ooze spots. And you can also count the number of bacteria in the cells. So that's a convenient way of looking at virulence. So my question was, okay, do the, does Irwinia have these nucleobase transporters? And that was sort of like a, a uh, 
straw man because of course bacteria have these two they take in nuclear bases from the outside because they're nitrogen rich and you you take what you can get so the first thing i had to do is find these genes in silico and this took me an afternoon okay it was very easy to do e coli has guanine transporters ur ursal transporters adenine and xanthine transporters you can fish those out do a search on the internet using various programs and find them in your window and they look very very similar they're about 83% or 80% amino acid identity and 90% similarity. So you'd expect that they do the same thing, but not so fast. I had done a lot of work in plant transporters in this family, and they all have sort of distinct profiles of what they can move. So you actually have to do the hard work and show that it does what you think it does. I know that's not so much easy these days. People look at a gene and it looks like something else and they assume it, it has the same function, but that's not necessarily the case. So the next question was, what do they do? What do they transport? How do you find that out? Well, an easy way to do is do some complementation experiments in E. coli. In E. coli, um, people have knocked out every viable gene that is, is possible. And the way they do that is they use a, what's called the lambda red system, where they make a construct that deletes the gene, puts in an uh, uh, antibiotic resistance marker, and exchanges it out. So you have a deletion of the locus you're interested in and, and a marker that you can follow. And lo and behold, there's the E. coli stock center at Yale, half a mile away, and you can buy these for like eight bucks each. That was easy. Okay. So I got a ursal transporter mutant, guanine transporter mutant, adenine, xanthine transporter mutants. The next thing to do is to take the Irwinia genes that are the analogs of these in E. coli and clone them into an expression vector and then put them into these deletion lines and see if they complement the deficiency in E. coli. Do they function the same way? So we used a high copy plasma called PQE80. That's under LAC operon control. That means you can put in a compound called IPTG and turn on the gene and get um, expression. And this one happened to be a uh, translational fusion. So you have a six histidine tag in the beginning. Um, People use that so they can fish out the protein. We had used it extensively with our plant transporters, and it works just fine. So we made these constructs and put them into the appropriate strain in coli and tested them. Um, I'm just going to go through the data on the guanine transporter, but we did this for all the different trans the ursal adenine and xanthines. So if you have a strain that is deficient in its own transporter and you put in an empty vector and you grow it up and you put in some radioactive guanine, it really doesn't take up very much. But if you put in the construct that has the Irwinia um, guanine transporter and turn it on, it takes up a significant amount. So you can show that it actually transports guanine. And we did it also for, for hypoxanthine. Next experiment is to see what can of the solute can bind into the binding site that each transporter has a specific thing, um, requirement for. So here we use a little bit of the same situation. We use a little bit of hot guanine and you put in a hundred to a thousand fold excess of cold guanine that competes with the hot guanine. And when you do that, you don't get much taken up because it's being competed out. And you can do that with other solutes to see if they also compete for the binding site. And that gives you a profile of what the binding site looks like. And at the same time, people, uh, my colleagues in in Greece who were working on fungal ones were actually mutating sites that allowed for binding and they were very similar. And the last thing to do is some inhibitors. Um, <clears throat> so in plants and bacteria, these are symporters are usually proton symporters so that when it's in an open state, if a proton and the ligand sit down together, you get a conformational change. And if you use a compound called CCCP, you disrupt the proton gradient and you don't get uptake. We also used Wabane, which is a sodium um, gradient disruptor because um, the human versions of these genes are sodium symporters, not proton symporters. And, and it doesn't seem to work on that. So you have to characterize the biochemistry in these. The next thing to do is you can grow these on, on toxic nucleobase analog. For example, um, guanine has a derivative called 8 azaguanine, which when taken up causes um, breaks in the DNA and is, is toxic. We also use 6 thioguanine which has a, a thio group in place of an oxygen. Um, for our uracil studies, we use 5-4-O-Uracil and 8 as adenine for adenine. Several of these are actually anti-cancer agents because they are taken up and 
break um, the DNA of actively growing cells. In fact, 5-fluorouracil is still used topically for people who have keratosis um, around them. So we did these studies and we asked the question, you know, can the Erwinia guanine transporter move 6 guanine into an E. coli cell? And the experiment is, um, yes, this is, it does. And how we did this is we used uh, a simple assay where we um, used a prong to imprint E. coli strains onto a plate and all of these E. coli strains lack their own guanine transporter. The left half only have the empty vector, the right half have the Irwinia gene for the guanine transporter. And um, in this particular Petri plate, we dotted in the middle a little bit of 0.1 normal NaOH, which is a control because that's what you use to dissolve 6 thioguanine And it diffuses out into the, as a gradient away from its dot as the bacteria are growing overnight. And you can see it has no effect on either of the two um, experimental um, bacteria. But if you deliver 300 micrograms of 6 thioguanine in the 0.1 normal NaOH and let them grow overnight, you get a gradient of 6 thioguanine It doesn't affect the um, control where you don't have the Irwinia gene, but it, it is a great effect on the um, genes that express the guanine transport, they take it up. So it does take up 6 thioguanine You can show this functionally. The next question is, just because it works that way in E. coli, you can't assume it's going to work that way in Irwinia. So you have to go in and make mutations in Irwinia and test that out. And the way we did this is, initially we used what's called the Lambda Red um, protocol, which they use in E. coli very well. And here, you can take almost any gene and amplify a PCR product that has a, a disease, uh, antibiotic resistance gene and flanking that about... 50 base pairs of DNA that you want to target. And if you have a particular plasmid called PKD46 in the background that allows and enhances homologous recombination, you can turn it on, you get an exchange of your endogenous gene and replaced by the disease resistance. This is how they do it in E. coli, and it works as well in Irwinia. So we were able to make these um, mutants in Irwinia. First thing we want to do is to make sure that the gene was turned on in in ooze, which is the bacterial form of the disease in, in apples. And yes, it's screening on when you do a, a reverse transcription PCR. We went on to make the exchange and make a deletion mutant that law loses the guanine transporter and verified it. And then did loss of a function experiment. So here we're growing um, a wild type Irwinia and the Irwinia that's lost the guanine transporter on is a guanine. So when you have the wild type strain and some 8 of guanine in presence, it is, um, doesn't grow as well. Whereas if you have the mutant, it's more resistant. So it's a loss of function and you would expect it to be more resistant to the toxic analog. You can also do a gain of function experiment where you have the same mutant in Irwinia, but put the gene back in on a plasmid and turn it on and say, what happens? And so when that happens, if you have a wild, uh, the empty vector, it's somewhat resistant to 6 thioguanine, And if you turn the gene on, it's more sensitive. Now, you would expect that it would be super sensitive to 6 thioguanine, like you saw in the E. coli. But it turns out I sort of pulled a fast one on you guys because Irwinia amylover is one of the few bacteria that actually makes 6 thioguanine and excretes it from the cell and uses it in the disease process to thwart other microorganisms from growing and potentially to kill plant cells. And biology is full of laws, okay, which are oftentimes broken. But one of the laws is, is that if you make a toxic analog, you don't want to poison yourself with it. So I fully expected that when you put the Irwinia gene back in to Irwinia, it would not, be, it would not bring in 6 thioguanine. Why would you do something like that? Okay. So there are several possibilities. One is the normally in the disease state, the 6 thioguanine uh, tra the guanine transporter is not on, but we know that's not the case, it's on. It could have evolved not to recognize 6 thioguanine, but from our biochemical studies, it does it just fine and it takes it up. In the operon that of the genes that make 6 thioguanine, there's a gene that's a membrane protein, which is uncharacterized, but it's most likely an efflux transporter that pushes things out of the cell. And it's probably a competition between the efflux of 6 thioguanine that's being made and the guanine transporter, which brings guanine things in. And 
I'm hoping to get to that before I retire. I don't know if I will, because it's, it, it's a bit of a challenging experiment, but it's an interesting side project. We went on to characterize biochemically the four transporter families that we have, um, looking at uptake and what do they uptake in some of the biochemical properties. And the next question is, what happens in a disease process? Do you need these transporters at all? And so we used these um, immature fruit assays. Here we have apples on the uh, right side and pears on the left side, which are also affected by Erwinia. And we infected them with wild type Erwinia or the deletion. And in both cases, they, they, they found they made ooze and had disease symptoms, both in apples and pears. So you don't need these transporters to actually fulfill um, your requirement to do, do disease. And in fact, you can take time points and look at the bacterial colony count as you go along in the disease process. Usually the mutant lags a little behind, but it catches up pretty fast. So you either can make it or you can bring it into the farm line. Well, at about this time, I this is when Tim's uh, McNallis's paper came out in 2019, or it's a little before that. And I was talking to him where he looked at all these different types of mutants in biosynthetic pathways. And I thought this is a great opportunity to try to do a sabbatical because we had common interests. And one of the things that I sort of centered on was, well, what happens in the springtime when the nitrogen stored in the roots is transported up to the growing parts, which are the flowers and the leaves. And the major transport molecules for nitrogen in apple and a number of other plants is the amino acids, asparagine, aspartate, and glutamine. Okay, this happens to coincide with the time that Irwinia infects plant cells. So this is a, a nice target to look at. And in fact, um, there was a paper about 20 years ago from Italy where they looked at the xylem sap coming up from the roots during the flowering time. And of course you had screaming amounts of asparagine, aspartate, and glutamine that dropped down a little bit back to normal levels once you had flowering happen. So this is a real phenomenon that happens. Tim McNellis's lab had found a, a mutant in the ASNB2 gene, the asparagine synthase gene. Now, many of the other amino acid knockout genes had, were non-virulent. They didn't grow very well in the fruitlet assay that he had done, but asparagine knockout does pretty well. Actually, it's, it's indistinguishable statistically from a, the wild type. So this suggests that either there's another biosynthetic gene to make asparagine, or there's a transporter that can take it in. And so I decided to do some more work on that. And the question is, how many asparagine genes, synthase genes are there in Irwinia? You look back at E. coli since they're very closely related. In E. coli, this is the, the last step in the reaction to make asparagine from aspartic acid. And here, um, E. coli has two different enzymes encoded by two different genes, a asparagine synthase A and B. The A gene uses ammonium to add on a nitrogen to make asparagine. And the B gene um, uses glutamine or ammonium to do the same reaction. When you look in Irwinia, it's a little bit different. Irwinia does not have the A version of the gene. It just doesn't exist in the genome. It does have the B version. They're very, very similar. But it has another version of what I call B2, which isn't present in E. coli. And it's got about 27% amino acid identity and 50% similarity. And it's found also in some other bacteria and they've slapped a label on it called asparagine synthase. Well, no one actually knows what it does. Just because it looks like it doesn't mean it, it functions. So, you know, we had to find out and, and do that. And so, unfortunately, the E. coli stock center that has the keto lines down at Yale where you can buy those lines at eight bucks a pop, they only do single mutants and we needed a double mutant, okay? So we actually had to make them ourselves. So we made a knockout in E. coli of both the A and B uh, asparagine synthase genes, cloned in Irwinia genes and put them into the strain and then assayed them for function. And here we have, we're looking at the B1 gene, which is present in Irwinia and e. e. coli and we put it in the double knockout E. coli line, which can't make its own asparagine, and asked it, does it fulfill the function? If you have the empty vector and you don't give it asparagine, but you give it ammonium, it just doesn't grow. If you supply the gene and turn it on, it grows, it can make its own asparagine, which is as to be expected. And we use this construct with a six-hist tag. 
right? We did the same thing for the second gene, the B2 gene, which is specific to Irwinia and not any e. coli. And this type of construct didn't work. And the reason for that probably is these asparagine synthase genes undergo a post-translational modification where they clip off the first methionine and the protein. And having a HIS tag in the beginning may have interfered with it. So what we did is we just cloned the whole gene with its own promoter and terminator and put it into that E. coli line and asked if it functioned. When we grow it in the presence of ammonium, it just doesn't do anything. But when we supply it with glutamine, which is another one of the um, compounds that is needed to fill it, it does function. So this is preliminary data and I've got to do a little bit more work in it, but it does look like it's an asparagine synthase. So the next question is, can we make these mutants in Irwinia and what do they do? We, um, Tim's lab had gotten a knockout line using a, tra a transposon type of thing, a TN5. They didn't have the second gene, so we had to make that. Now, wouldn't you know that Lambda Red system that I had been working with in, in Irwinia and E. coli stopped working about three years ago. Okay, it just, I was knocking my head on the wall trying to get it to work. It just wouldn't work. So we figured it might, the plasma may have gone bad. And so Regan ordered the plasma for me and it can't, it was in Taiwan. And this is during COVID and it took like nine months to get it. So I needed a different way to mutagenize these um, uh, organisms. And we came upon a system called PNOC. And these are basically integrated plasmids that can combine, recombine into the site of uh, your targeting. And there are several flavors that you can use to select things, canamycin, chloramphenicol, gentamicin, tetracycline. These plasmids can't replicate on their own unless they're in a specific background, a pure background. So if you put them in a wild type strain, the only option that for them to survive is to go into the genome, okay? And so what we did is we took this plasm with its uh, selectable marker, cloned in a bit of our gene of interest, threw it into the cells. The only option it had was to recombine. And when that happens, you duplicate the cloned area and you integrate the plasma and select for the, the, the drug resistance. And if you use PCR using selectable markers that are specific to the host and the integrant, you can verify that you have the correct insert. And in fact, that's what you see on this next slide. And I'm not gonna labor you going through it, but when you make a mutant, you gotta verify that it's in the right place and it looks as expected. So we do this for all our mutants. So that's where I am at this point. We're going to start to do functional studies in Irwinia. And the next step is to do apple fruitlet studies, see how it grows on stigma surfaces and how it grows in the vasculature of stems in Irwinia, which are the three different main areas that disease occurs. And so that's what I'm gonna be doing going forward. Now, at the same time, we wanted to look at aspartate mutants because it also is a nitrogen transporter. Um, and Tim's lab, McNellis' lab, did find an aspartate mutant. And the reason for that is you need a double mutant in order not to have aspartate. In E. coli, there are two genes, aspartate amino acid transferase and tyrosine amino acid transferase. We're getting a little bit of background here, I think, of noise. Um, and you need to knock both out in order to get a mutant because they both complement each other in different reactions. So oxalacetate can use either enzyme to make aspartate or they can use it to make tyrosine or they can use it to make phenylalanine, which has a third enzyme involved in it. So we had to go in and knock out two genes at once. Again, we went into E. coli, knocked out both those genes with lambda red. So we have a host to test things in. We cloned the Irwinia genes and put them back in and said, do we want to do the experiment? Now here's where I use my favorite piece of equipment, the prong, okay? We're lucky enough here in, in um, Lindsay's lab to have a 96 well um, scanner that can take OD readings and shake at the same time at any given temperature for over, for like a day, all right? So you can do these growth profiles, okay? They didn't have that in the plant pathology lab at Penn State. Now, I love working at the bench, but not enough to spend 24 hours taking 30-minute readings, okay? But you can do the same thing by imprinting these onto um, Petri plates. And so for the E. coli work, we have a wild-type E. coli line, the double mutant that has cannot make asparagine or tyrosine, 
or that double mutant with either of those Irwinia genes in it. And if you grow them with asparagine and tyrosine and phenylalanine, they grow just fine. But if you leave out tyrosine or aspartic acid or both, only the, the um, bacteria that have the enzyme, uh, the gene brought in will complement and function. So they the Irwinia genes work like they do in E. coli. The next step is to make mutants in Irwinia and see if they work the same way. We used the PNOX systems to do that. And the same thing works out that way. So if you have a double mutant in Irwinia and you don't supply it with one of the other genes, it, it needs to be given tyrosine or spartate acid. If you give either of those genes, it can do function. So it works similar to E. coli. So we established function. And again, this is where we're at. Now we're going to do the virulent studies, the growth and stigmas, et cetera. Which brings me to my next part. Um, can you use altered Irwinia strains as biocontrol agents against themselves? And people have tried this before by knocking out virulence genes in Irwinia and had limited success, partly because the presence of virulence genes helps it grow really well on the stigmatic surface. So we're hoping that by having biosynthetic mutants that can still grow in the stigma, but not elsewhere in the plant that you might be able to use it. And so we started looking at some metabolite mutants. Um, there are three different models that you can have. Um, one's a call of how this works. One's called the, I, I call it the styrofoam ball model. And this is you spray on your biocontrol agent, it lands on the stigma and it takes up space. It really doesn't divide, it just takes up space. You'd have to lay it on pretty thick to keep competing out the wild chip or winia. And if you're trying to convince your colleagues that this is how it works, you'd also have to lay it on pretty thick because I don't think this is how it works. Okay. The next is the land grab model. And that is you spray it on to, and it hits the stigma and divides and takes up more space before the Irwinia infection actually occurs. And this is how some people think it's going to work. And the third model I came up with is what I call the adolescent model. When my brother and I were teenagers, regardless of whether we were in a growth spurt, we just consumed huge quantities of food and we depleted the nutrient content of my parents' refrigerator. So you can think of the biocontrol agent doing the same thing. They land on the stigma, which is nutrient rich, and they just start eating things and depleting the environment so that the arrhenia comes around it is left with less there. So there are these various models that we think are how things are working. Now, a successful biocontrol agent, in our case, would grow on the stigma and eat on the stigma, but not elsewhere in the plant. So you don't, especially if you're using a disease organism. So we're looking for mutants that allow growth on the stigma, but not in the fruit or in the vascular system. And here, you know, this is just, you, you grow on the, we allowed it to grow on the stigma, it slides down, but it doesn't go any further than that because it's thwarted, okay? And so, um, we're investigating various different pathways in combinations to see what happens. Here we have uh, sort of a Venn diagram of various me metabolic pathways. We have primidine synthesis genes that I talked about earlier. We have amino acid biosynthetic mutants. We have nitrogen uptake mutants. We have carbon utilization mutants. I'll just talk about that. We have other ones like thymine production or FOXA is a sedidophore that allows iron to be taken up. And you can use these in different combinations to see which ones work in the environments you're interested in. Um, one of them what we recently worked on is GAP-A, which is here. It's upstream of the TCA cycle, but it doesn't allow glucose or fructose to be used when you knock it out. And we were successfully able to get that PKD plasma from Taiwan and finally get it to use and made a GAP-A mutant. And so we're in involved in seeing how it works. Um, we made a whole bunch of other mutants in different pathways. The TN5 mutants already existed in Tim's lab from a previous study, but we did a lot of these PNOC mutants, plasma integrative ones, and deletion mutants. Um, now that's uh, Lambda Red's coming up and double mutants so that we can go on to do stigma growth studies and fruit studies, et cetera. And so that's where I'm at now. So I did actually do something on my sabbatical, believe it or not. And I, as well as having a good time. And I want to thank a number of different people here. Uh, when I was a, a postdoc, I worked with Tim Nelson, and Steve Della Porter doing the maze experiment. And that was up, not in this field plot, but in the back nine where the nut trees are actually at the farm. 
I want to thank Quan and Regan specifically because they've helped me out a lot. Um, during the 20 years or so that I was working on plant transporters, I worked with a, a colleague, George Morant at Indiana Purdue University, and we had a lot of masters and undergraduate students got a lot of good work done on a, at a minimal cost. And he re has since retired about a year ago. And of course I did uh, worked in Tim McNellis's lab and as a technician there, Judy Zinn, who helped things out. We're gonna continue to work on that. I think that's it. And I did it in record time. So, are there any questions that, that people might have, at least in the audience here? I'm not sure if I can. In your adolescent model, mm -hmm. so you spray your biocontrol on the plant, yeah. And then it's going to be different, but the, the, the plant needs to be different to develop the fruits. Right. How does it how does that impact your model? So, so on the stigma, <clears throat> oh, yes. Um, so how does the, the adolescent model where the, the biocontrol agent is eating nutrients? and depleting the environment that the disease organism would be on. How does that work? Well, the stigmatic surface, which is unfortunately not flat, is very curved, produces a lot of exudates that um, have a number of different carbon molecules and peptides in it, as well as, as other molecules, um, to facilitate the growth of pollen and the germination and growth of pollen down the stigma to the, uh, the ovaries, okay? So it's a nutrient-rich environment, and that's a in in terms of the fire blight disease. That's where your when you first la uh, lands, multiplies, gets its its virulence genes turned on, and the population is is increased over a couple of days, and then slides down and infects. So if you can put something in there, either an incapacitated your or some other biocontrol agent that not only takes up space but depletes the nutrients in there when your comes in you may have a way of thwarting disease in some part. Now, nowadays they use antibiotic spray streptomycin to keep a fire blight at bay and it works really well, but you're getting resistant varieties popping up. And for example, they banned its use in Europe. You can't use it in organic farming and it probably will be banned here. So people are really scrambling to look for alternative methods of control and biocontrol is one part of a multi-integrated pest management scenario of controlling fire bike, particularly now that the cultivation practices have changed and disease spread is more of an issue. Charlie? No, I mean, it's independent of pollination. Pollination happens at that time. Oh, oh right. So is, is this biocontrol at all linked to pollination? Um, it, this is during the time of pollination. And of course, that's when insects are going around and and taking nectar and stuff and bringing pollen from different plants. But you don't need pollen present at all to, to use biocontrol agents. Um, it doesn't seem to affect it that much. People have done studies on that. You still, you, probably because there's so much pollen around that, you know, you just need one to go in there and to make a successful trip down the stock. Any other questions? Any, any oh, yeah. Yeah, a little louder, please. Uh, you, in your experiment, was it uh, the knockout, the E. coli? Yeah. In the genes, and I just wonder if this technology can be used in the plant cells, or can we knock out the plant genes? Yeah, unfortunately not. It's a different environment because it, you know, it, it's easy in bacteria because the, the uh, chromosome is, is present in the cytoplasm, basically. Whereas in plants, you'd have to not only deliver it into the plant cell, but then into the nucleus. Now, you can do transformations in plants um, using gene guns or agrobacterium, um, but it's at a much, much reduced frequency. So probably you'd be at disadvantage trying to, to get a homologous integration. Also, hom homologous integration in eukaryotes happens readily in yeast, but not so much elsewhere. They've gotten it to work in human cells, um, but it, it doesn't, you usually get non-homologous integration where it jumps in somewhere else in the chromosome. So targeting it to a particular area is very difficult. So. Oh, one question. Um, the product that Erwinia produces to inhibit competing organisms, that's H6-thyroguanine. Yeah. Six, okay. Uh, 
and all these knockouts, then they're they're not uh, susceptible to that. Um, it's only the so is are the not since Irwinia makes six thioguanine, and it can take it in using the guanine transporter. The knock most of the knockout unless you've knocked out the guanine transporter gene, you would be susceptible to taking it in. But at the same time, on the plant, you're probably making it and pushing it out of the cell at a high frequency, probably at a greater rate than you're taking it in. And this is an experiment that would take a fair amount of finesse to do. You'd have to figure out the concentrations of each and the efflux and influx. But that's probably how it works. Uh, Neil, on the, on the chat, um, Juan asks a very similar question. He says, do those amino acids serve as a signal to turn on virulence genes of the linea animal? That we don't know yet. So doing some expression. So uh, are any of the amino acids or other metabolites, um, do they serve as signals to up the regulation of some of these virulence genes which are turned on on the stigmatic surface? And we don't know that. So that would be something to look at. Um, and, and Quan has some nice plasmids that are a green fluorescent and red fluorescent that might be able to address that question. So. Are there any other questions in the chat? Sorry, in the chat? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming. Okay.